Hey everybody, thanks so much for um, joining us in this webinar um, this week. Uh, we usually try to do a webinar um, every month. Um, was really excited when I met uh, Aaron at Expo West, I believe, um, this year for the first time and, and kind of what they were doing at, at Adapted, but more her like overall knowledge on how to maximize media spend um, for brands. Uh, I think we've all seen kind of the ROI on media spend decrease for a lot of us um, over the last year. Uh, we've seen it with a lot of the brands that we work with uh, where the ROI just isn't there for their Facebook ads. Uh, we've seen all the changes to iOS and, and all that. And so we've seen a lot of brands try to scramble to, to maximize their marketing spend and, and how to increase their business there. So I've uh, been really impressed with what Aaron's building over at Adapted, but more again, like I said, just her overall knowledge on the space. And so I think she's going to provide us with a little bit of background, best practices, um, kind of some creative solutions, and hopefully a playbook that all of us can kind of take with us after. Um, don't feel like you have to feverishly take notes or anything. We do put all of this um, on our um, YouTube channel after um, after we'll uh, probably next week we'll publish it. And what we'll do is we'll do kind of 20 to 30 minutes for the webinar, and then we'll open up for questions after, uh, and we'll kind of go from there. So uh, I will mute myself and uh, kick it over to Aaron, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Cameron. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, really excited to kind of walk you guys through, you know, kind of our perspective on, on how we think you should navigate the media landscape as a you know, small emerger or even mid-sized brand. Things are obviously very, very different for each individual brand. Um, but especially as you begin to understand and take a look at, you know, what is available to you, um, the choices can be overwhelming. And so hopefully today we'll be able to, you know, kind of walk you through, you know, the current, you know, media landscape as it stands today, what's available to you and how to set the right, take the right steps uh, to maximize, uh, you know, your, your media spend and your investment. Um, what you'll notice here is on our title slide, what we actually did was strike out spend, uh, because right off the bat, we want you to start thinking about the way that you spend and allocate your budget differently, right? It's not an advertising expense. It is an investment. And we hope that, you know, through every choice that you make and every dollar that you spend, you are getting something back from that. And so hopefully, you know, today we'll be able to kind of take you through that. So a little bit, bit about me. Um, I've been with Ad Adapted here for about five years. Um, I'm also a professional band nerd. Uh, I was in marching band in college. Um, but over the last five years here at Adapted, what I've done is work my way up through the ranks. Um, started in sales as a business development representative, just helping uh, bring in leads. To our sales team and now we've grown from you know just a lowly nine people uh to almost 100 here in the last five years and it's been really exciting uh, getting to work with brands of all shapes and sizes understanding you know what their goals are um what they're focused on how media has impacted the choices they've made and to watch some of them grow from being very very small brands in one retailer to being along that journey with them and working with them now that they're in 20,000 across the united states and so um i'm gonna go ahead and turn my video off here now so that i don't um I'm looking at a different screen because I don't have two screens where I'm at, um, but I'll go ahead and kind of uh, dive in here. Um, so, you know, as we look at, you know, where we are today, a lot of things have changed, um, you know, in the last uh, 20, 30, 50, 100 years. As we look at advertising, I think the first coupon that Coke did might have been in, I don't know, late 18, 1880s. Um, they were the first one to, to print a coupon to try to drive, you know, individuals to try Coke. And if you were around at this time, I don't think I was not around at this time. I had to be told when these ads, uh, when these ads were out there. Um, but at one point in time, you know, the entire world was singing the song, I'd like to buy the world of Coke. Um, you know, I'm sure this will come as a shock to you, uh, but large brands face a lot of different challenges today than smaller emerging brands. Uh, in the early days of advertising, whether it was TV, billboards, paper ads, physical coupons, um, you know, brands like P&G and Coke were writing a book on how to do it. Um, it didn't matter where you were, or what you were doing, right? You knew where to, where to, where to be aware, I guess, of, of, these, of these different brands. And now, you know, with all the competitors, um, all the different retailers, all the different ways that you can jump into this space, um, you know, you're faced with your own unique challenges in this, in this set. Um, you know, as we look at, you know, where we're at and, and the questions you're asking yourself as a, as a new and emerging brand, you know, some of the big ones are, how are you going to differentiate yourself in a crowded, crowded, crowded category, right? Is it going to be your branding? Is it the quality of your product? Is it giving back to the world, to the environment, um, to different organizations? Is it your audience? Is it the price point, right? The next is when and where are you going to launch? Um, you know, are you thinking about whether to launch in store, online, which channel, natural, club, right? Are you going to launch into mass retail um, or both, right? Even online, there's more than Amazon to launch in. And so, you know, these choices um, can present their own challenges individually. Um, but also, what's the best way to build brand awareness? You know, it's not just billboards and TV ads and things like that these days. Now there's all these things on mobile, all these things on digital, and so many different ways that you can engage and reach with reach individuals and make them aware and invite them to try your products. Um, and picking which ones are going to work for you can depend on a lot of different factors. 
Um, so where you start, you know, as and, and what vendors you choose and how you're going to execute, um, it's a very, very long list and there's a cost associated with all of those things. Um, we're not saying, right, as we think about today, we're not saying there's going to be a recession. There's definitely a lot of uncertainty in the marketplace right now. And so as you're thinking about, you know, different ways and, and, and what to do and how to navigate this, um, you know, today we're going to walk you through a couple different things to think about and then hopefully end on, you know, what different uh, goals are available to, or tactics are available to you based on your goals and then talk a little bit about, you know, where at Adapted, where we fit into the mix. So the big question right now is, will history repeat itself? I think, you know, through the pandemic, a lot of things changed. We all had to adapt and evolve very, very quickly as we navigated that landscape. And now we're kind of faced with a really uncertain path ahead. You know, during the pandemic and during the last recession, we saw a lot of things that were the same, but we also saw a lot of different uh, things that were different. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw that there were less frequent trips to the grocery store, uh, whereas in the recession, we saw more frequent trips, right? Um, those less frequent trips during the pandemic were met with larger basket sizes and larger shopping lists, whereas those more frequent trips were much, much smaller and really only reaching out for necessities. Um, the other thing is that we did see a lot of um, the, the retailer differentiation for the consumer change quite a bit. You know, nobody today really is a one stop shopper. But when you're faced with, you know, unfortunately, the fear of, of the pandemic, you know, a lot of shoppers were thought, thinking to themselves, I better figure out where to go and only go once. Uh, because the more places I go, the more chances there are for me to, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, catch COVID um, at the time. And of course, these things change as, as you know, the outlook changes. But um, during that time, and, and things that have changed historically is, you know, back in the day, private label products didn't really present themselves as a competitor. But now they're one of the largest competitors that any brace, any brand faces in any given category. As we we saw that shift for consumers actually going towards those discounted, cheaper, or even private label products. Over 30% of those customers actually stayed with those products in those categories and didn't go back to their GIF or their Skippy, right? And so for us, understanding how that impacts, you know, a consumer going forward really can change the outlook and the way that we choose to advertise. Um, naturally, increased coupon usage is going to happen with any uh, economic downturn. But the biggest thing I think that changed for a lot of, you know, us in this space today uh, was accelerated e-commerce. You know, that, that's been around for quite some time, but in the grocery space, it was really just getting started, you know, in the, um, you know, from 2010, 2020, and 2020, it took off, you know, now I think over 40% of shoppers are buying some or all of their groceries online. And even in 2021, 90% of all shoppers at least bought online once, right? That's a lot of people. And so when you're thinking about how to allocate your budgets and how to think about how to, you know, put money behind, whether it's in-store, you know, support, e-com or both, um, picking the right mix and picking the right, uh, you know, I guess, percentage of allocation um, can be difficult. And so instead of taking it from me, you know, in the post pandemic world, knock on wood, hopefully we don't have to go back to that. Um, consumer, consumers are faced with rising prices, disrupted supply chains, and obviously potentially, you know, uncertain environments going ahead. Um, history does often repeat, repeat itself. But if you look at these three guys here, I think most of you might know who these guys are. Um, the first one is going to be Sam Walton. He is the actual founder uh, of Walmart. Um, but when he was asked once upon a time what he thought about a recession, he said, I thought about it and decided not to partic participate. Uh, what I'm setting up here is really to kind of help you guys understand and think about, you know, what's what's ahead differently as we look towards, you know, what to do in an economic downturn, potentially, as we try to allocate that media budget and, and whether or not to cut it. Um, Warren Buffett, very, very famous guy, said, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Um, and finally, Bruce Barton said, when times are good, you should advertise. When times are bad, you must advertise. If you don't know who Bruce Barton is, he's most famous for writing the book, The Man Nobody Knows. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is, regardless of where you're at in your brand's life cycle, this will have an impact on how you spend your dollars. Um, if history tells, tells us anything, it's not to go dark. In times like this, brands will go one of two ways. They either cut their marketing costs first, because it's super easy to justify, or they spend more. Well, let me tell you what happens when you slash your marketing budget. Media has a half-life. Consumers have a very short memory. So when brands go dark, they lose top of mind awareness extremely quickly. And this gives competitors' brands a chance to steal wallet share. So there's one piece of advice that we can give you is take advantage of the current climate. There will be less noise to cut through. You'll be able to portray yourself from a from a position of strength and stability, and you can increase your share of voice while others are quiet. So how do you know what's best for your brand? Pretty broad question. Uh, but when a group of marketers across several CPGs was asked how they allocated their retail media budget and whether or not they were satisfied with the outcome, almost 80% said they were unsure or unhappy. 80%. That is an overwhelming majority, leaving just over 20% of individuals satisfied with how they did it. This is not unique to just retail media. The same story persists across all types of media. 
And while I'm sure you know this, brands should structure their advertising budget based on their business strategy, even though many brands are budgeting by retailer or platform. This might seem easy or intuitive, um, but unfortunately, retail media networks have kind of come in here and, and changed the game in the last couple of years. Um, and unfortunately, if you focus only on you know, retailer or platform, uh, it really is a backwards way of looking at things instead of looking forward and looking ahead. Um, another approach to allocating media uh, spend is by metrics, such as target ROAS, uh, which is predictable, easy to calculate, but unfortunately, it does limit sales and market share growth. Um, overall, just because it worked for them in the past doesn't mean it's going to work for you today. Um, when you look at what's actually available to you, this is just a snapshot of what's out there in every single individual bucket. It's extremely overwhelming. When P&G and Coke were taking a look at what they had available to them 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, deciding which media vendor to go with wasn't wasn't that difficult. Now it's like standing in the yogurt aisle at a grocery store trying to figure out which brand to buy. The paradox of choice is extremely overwhelming. Um, but there are some things that we know for sure, right? The paths to purchase are infinite. There is definitely not one right way to do it. Um, I think that we also know across, you know, many, many different uh, research uh, or many people that we've re um, reached out to that it does take over 10 touches to actually convert an individual. And whether that touch is comprised of social media, search, programmatic, coupons, and things like that, um, there are so many different ways to get to 10 if you look at this this, this, this list here, uh, which just makes choosing media partners infinitely more complicated. Um, you know, If you look back in the past and look at what your predecessors have done, you look at what you know your competitors have done in the same space, doing what they did is not going to get you ahead of them. right? You have to think about you. Why are you different? Why are you special? And what are you going to do to make sure that, that, that you get the leg up on, the, on them in the future? Um, and finally, you know, again, going back to all of this, right, most brands are actually allocating their, their budget based on the historical media mixes. You know, again, it's not going to work for you because it worked for them. In some cases, you can repeat and, and do it over again. It's also successful. But things change so rapidly in this space, especially with how technology has evolved just in the last two years, that it's so it's more important now than ever to align your strategy and your tactics uh, with your goals in the current uh, consumer environment. Luckily, we can drill this down a bit more simply for food and beverage brands. So if you think about the typical CPG solution tweet or what's available to you guys, there are two big buckets that we kind of focus on, upper and lower funnel. Generally for CPGs and especially emerging brands, the lower funnel is where the majority of the ad dollars are spent as these tactics tend to drive more velocity off shelf and engage with consumers where they are. One thing we hear from most brands that we support is that they're putting a big chunk of their budget behind social tactics because everyone else is doing it. Pretty sure we all learned in grade school what peer pressure is. But if I were to ask for a show of hands, which I can't right now because we're on Zoom, I'd be willing to bet that almost all of you have, would have been told the same. But the reality is just because it worked for them doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Um, to top it all off, early and growth stage media budgets tend to be a bit tighter compared to what the big players in the space have, further limiting what's available for you to put into your stack. And I think Cameron's recording this. You'll be able to take this and, and digest a lot of these uh, other bullet points that are on these individual slides. But when Coke and P&G, again, you know, back, looking back, right, um, we're, we're deciding where to put their money and what to advertise in, um, top of funnel tactics were basically all that existed. Now those brands and every other large brand in the space uh, have the resources to reach consumers in all parts of their journey without breaking a sweat. Whether they choose to do that or not, it's entirely up to the weather that day, honestly. Less than 20 years ago, you might have only needed an agency or two to cover all of your needs. Now the biggest players have 10 or more agencies and it's even harder to pick who for what. Trust me, we work in this space. We have agency partners that we work with across so many different aisles. And it's honestly astounding to me how many, how many, how many different places you can work with and how many vendors there are out there. But as an emerging brand with, with limited budgets, it's crucial to put your dollars closer to the point of purchase and drive conversion to fuel that growth. At this stage, you know, wherever you're at, whether you're looking at, you know, bringing on an agency or even bringing on a consultant to help you, you're probably only thinking about one, not 10, right, different ones. And so even though the purchase funnel, you know, as a concept is relatively simple, each part is kind of faced with its own individual challenges, right? In the upper funnel, there's low measurement, low context. In the middle of the funnel, it's also hard to measure, right, and hard to reach shoppers that are in those pre-shop and planning phases. There's not a lot of solutions out there to, to, to act on. In the lower funnel, even though discounting is a great way to drive trial, it often isn't the best way to drive, you know, loyalty and repeat purchase for lifetime value. This is why goal setting in general is extremely, extremely important. Um, so if you get to know your brand, right, in the space that you're in versus knowing what your competitor did, you're going to end up with a more tailored suite of solutions that's custom towards you. Your goal should depend on a number of things. You know, as we look at this list here on the left-hand side, uh, you can be asking yourself, where are you in this product life cycle, right? Are you doing research right now, trying to figure out who's your target audience? Are you in that growth phase? Are you on shelf trying to excel velocity, trying to get to that mature stage where your sales are cruising and you're really just trying to go for acquisition or making yourself one of the bigger players in this space? Are you faced with tons of competition? 
right? As we look at what's happening today, especially with private label, um, that's becoming more and more difficult to stay differentiated in. And so think to yourself, right, is that going to be a goal for you? Is it more important for you to make sure that you're better than the competitor? Or is it more important for you to have the shelf space, right, get the distribution, get the awareness, et cetera? Um, but also, are you a base business or a base product, right, or a new product? Um, you think about, you know, some of the products that have entered the space in the last five years. Kombucha has been around for a while, but they didn't really hit their stride until about five, six years ago. You know, no one was drinking it then, and now everyone's drinking it now. And so those are products that, you know, took time to get adoption. But once they gained adoption and gained traction, all of a sudden, tons of competitors came on in. Um, but also, more importantly, and finally, right, the current economic environment. If you're launching right now, if you're trying to grow right now, increase distribution right now, um, you know, those are all faced with different challenges in today's world. And it's important to take a step back and understand, you know, if I'm the consumer and what I'm thinking about today, how is that going to impact my ability to buy my own product? Um, unfortunately, if you don't do this, most brand budgets now are allocated based on what their predecessors had success with, which is why 85% of emerging brands fail and only 15% succeed. I know that's a really scary stat, but it is the unfortunate truth. It came from Nielsen. I'll have to cite that somewhere in here. Um, and so here are a few steps that you can take to ensure that you're getting the most bang for your buck, if you will. Um, the first, when you're looking at defining and prioritizing your goals, um, the prioritization for me is going to be the most important piece. You know, a lot of brands, especially in those early stages, are thinking, about distribution, thinking about getting on shelf or getting online and getting those initial um, individuals uh, to buy the product is super, super important. But sometimes brand awareness has to come first, right? People excited about your product. Um, what comes to mind for me in this stage is High Noon. High Noon launched, I think, in the in the summer of 2020, and they were all focused on awareness, all social, all influ influencers before they actually hit the shelf, and they took off. They took Truly and White Claw by storm, and they were extremely effective because their goals and the tactics they used to align with that were perfect to get them where they are today. Day. Um, differentiation, education, right, and loyalty are going to be key in this in this area too. But again, prioritize what, what makes the most sense first so that you can determine those KPIs for success next. Across the board, you know, you can have a combination of these things. I think cost is a big thing for emerging brands anyways, but cost and performance, cost and ROAS, cost and sales lift, cost and trial, all those things can go together and you can optimize based on what makes the most sense for you. Um, taking these two buckets together, testing and learning is going to be crucial as you begin to build your stack and understand what's going to make sense for for you. As much as I would love all of you to buy at Adapted and pay for WeStock and do all of that, that's just not feasible, right? It's not going to work for everybody. And so to take everything that you're learning, leverage your network of brand peers to research and discover what else is out there. Um, you know, there are many tactics in many buckets that accomplish the same things, but sometimes you might find that there's one that's actually better for you than another. Um, and once you've actually been able to understand who those individuals are or who those vendors are, invest in the highest yielding partners, right, based on their ability to meet your KPIs and continue to execute upon that, right? As you're growing and as you're building that stack and making sure that all these puzzle pieces and all of these things are working towards your benefit, um, you know, it allows you to get a better idea and understanding of when it's good to test and learn again, when it's good to reevaluate, right? Pick a new agency or even pick a new a new path, pick a new goal, right? As your, your goals and your these steps are always going to change based on where you're at in your product life cycle. Um, but as those things change and as, as those develop, um, you'll be able to kind of use this as a nice groundwork to understand, you know, what's the best it to take for you. So finally, to kind of close this all out and summarize everything we've talked about today, these are a couple of the crucial brand goals that, you know, I've at least learned and heard from a lot of the clients that I work with today, especially in the emerging brand space. Um, if we bucket them all together and we think about distribution, awareness, trial, and then sales and velocity, um, we tie these together. I'm winking at you, Cameron. Uh, but increased distribution, obviously, we stocks going to be a great partner for that. As you think about brand awareness, there are so many different things available for you, whether it's social, influencers, sampling, event sponsorship, giveaways, you know, the trade desk, they've come out of nowhere, uh, and programmatic media. There are many different ways to reach a lot of consumers very quickly and boost awareness for your brand. Uh, when it comes to the lower funnel, thinking about trial, sales, and velocity, um, there's a plethora of lower funnel solutions out there. Obviously, couponing is going to be a great way for you to actually increase trial, um, you know, initially. Um, but in-store trade promotions are going to be huge for you as well, discounts. And then also add adapted, which we'll get to, is a great way to do that as well. Um, from sales and velocity perspective, again, a lot of these solutions can do the same thing. Um, but shop and trade marketing have become extremely important as we look at, you know, what's out there and how to get your dollars closer to that point of purchase. Retail media networks, um, even though they've kind of come in and, and taken the world by storm in the last couple of years, they are there to help you and support you. Um, it's important for you to work with them to gain data, understand who your shoppers are um, so that you can improve 
improve and expand your, your offerings to those shoppers in those individual retail stores. In market, if you're looking for something that's more geo-focused um, and beacon-focused, so that when shoppers actually come in the vicinity of a store uh, and you want to hit them you know, with a notification or a push notification, they're fantastic. And then hyphen and other e-commerce um, options out there, Micmac, Smart Commerce, Basketful, and Chicory are going to be great ways in addition to their retail media networks to increase those sales both in-store and online. So with that, I'll go ahead and transition here into where Ad Adapted fits in. Um, this won't take more than, you know, more than a couple of minutes, and then we'll kind of open this up for questions. Um, but when we started, you know, this company about 10 years ago, we noticed that there was a missed opportunity in the digital space, not capitalizing on grocery lists. Historically, and even still today, many, many individuals are building their grocery list on pen and paper on the back of an envelope, right? The typical, you know, path to purchase for them would be that planning phase. They would go to the store, see what's on their list. If they go to the yogurt aisle and they just put yogurt on their shopping list, they get to pick. Do I want Chobani today? Do I want Activia? Do I want YoPlay? Right? Whatever those options are, typically those decisions were made at shelf um, across the board. And so what we're hoping, what we hope to change and is what we, you know, kind of came into the space to do was capitalize on a lot of those shoppers going digital. And today over 50% of grocery shoppers are using a mobile grocery list app to plan their grocery trips. What's nice about that is that mobile grocery lists allow you to know what is on a shopper's list before they even walk into the store, right? People don't build lists of things they don't plan to buy. And as economic uncertainty increases, impulse buys go down and being on a list is more important now than ever, right? Whether that individual, that shopping, that shopper is building a shopping list to buy their groceries in store or to buy some or all of their groceries online, um, you know, the combinations of those visits and that individual journey are also endless, which is why the path to purchase and the, the vendors that you choose for yourself are so crucial at this point. And so what is shopping list marketing, right? Who is it? Um, you know, when we came into this space and we started integrating our technology into different grocery list apps, um, we realized that with all this list data, we can actually provide really powerful and meaningful insights back to our clients, but also leverage that to engage with our shoppers in a much more meaningful way. Uh, today, we integrate with over 36 of the leading grocery list apps on the market. Um, and all of those, across all of those apps, we have real-time first-party data that comes to us so that we can actually say, hey, you're shopping at Walmart, you're actually in the, in the market for cinnamon, let's put Spice Island in front of you. And so if you look here on the left hand side, add to list is going to be our solution for actually engaging and driving trial and influencing purchase decisions, both in store at and at, and at shelf. Um, so you see on the far left hand side is a custom in app native unit where it shows a high res product shot copy and a title. Um, we actually co-branded this particular campaign with Walmart logo, that's possible, but we can also present this and show only your brand logo as well, depending on whether you're doing shopper or more of a general play, where the call to action on these ads is always add to list. What's really unique about this is that by the time this user receives this ad, we've already identified them as a key shopper and the most relevant person to actually engage with this ad unit because we, we look at their shopping list and saw that they were active in category for cinnamon, maybe nutmeg, maybe vanilla, vanilla extract, et cetera and we prompted them to add that to their grocery list. Additionally, we can take all those same targeting pieces and layer those on for e-commerce. And so on the right-hand side, you see an, an ad unit that's being served in the Weather Channel app. Just an example here, where the call to action is actually add to cart. We have a unique partnership with an e-commerce uh, platform that allows us to bypass a lot of those interstitials and what happens and what causes drop-off and friction excuse me, to drop one click, to drop all these products into a shopping list or a shopping cart with truly one click. The nice part about the e-com activation is that we do offer that to all of our um, to all of our, our clients. And so I would say the majority of our clients are using Add to List and e-commerce simultaneously. We have some that are focused solely on in-store and then we have some that are focused solely on e-com, but we always have the best measure of success and the best way to actually, you know, drive, you know, results in the back end is going to be to use a combination of both. So getting deeper into the audience that I've talked about, um, again, today we have 36 different apps that we integrate with. Just to give you some background, when I started here five years ago, I think we had 15 apps and 30 million devices that we could reach. And now that's grown to 36 and 72 million devices. Um, the one thing that you will notice about this slide or about these apps is that the majority of them, in fact, all of them are retailer agnostic. And that was done on purpose. Um, you know, again, going back to you know consumer the consumer journey, nobody today is a one-stop shopper. Nobody only shops at Walmart and only shops at Target and only shops at Kroger, right? We all have different preferences for where we buy things. I personally, I got a Sprouts for my produce, Target for my snacks, and Costco for pretty much everything else, right? But my journey is not your journey. It's not his journey. It's not her journey, right? As we think about how to segment our media and really be effective with how we're reaching shoppers and layering all these important parts, uh, we're able to convert at a higher rate because we're reaching the shoppers where they are, not just blanket targeting them and hoping that they're going to convert at Walmart when they've never bought snacks at Walmart ever, right? And so beyond this, beyond the 72 million devices we can reach inside of our 
uh, our grocery list app network. We can also reach an additional 30 million individuals online specifically. While the majority of our shoppers in our network also shop online, we do have 30 specific e-com shoppers that we can reach beyond this. So I know it's just as easy to go onto Facebook and select an audience who's engaged with gluten-free content in the past, but there's also no way to ensure that person will engage with the same content in the future. Were they trialing a gluten-free product just because? Did a friend refer them? Is it a true dietary restriction that keeps them in category? Shopping lists are future looking. And that's what's so cool about this data is that people don't build lists of things they don't plan to buy, right? I would never put almond milk or you know bananas on my list today just to not buy them. Nobody builds a don't list. And so in our case, we're taking all this shopping list data, layering on all of our location data to understand, okay, if I'm a gluten-free pasta brand and I wanna reach shoppers specifically at Target, what's the best way to identify the right shopper, right? Is it layering? on target first, zoning in on who's active in category for gluten, gluten free, allergen free, fro fresh, frozen and pasta, and then even going one step further, making those things all go together so you can reach those right individuals. We think that identifying and isolating those individuals and expanding from there is the best way to engage and it significantly increases you know engagement rates for us by leveraging first party real time shopping list data we're not only identifying where they prefer to shop right but we're understanding from their list analysis whether they're in category at a store and are able to actually help you convert them you know right at that you know at that moment that they're making those those decisions so in summary, I guess mostly in general, um, you know, we've worked with brands over the last five, five to 10 years, um, you know, in all stages of their growth, whether they're super, super small brands and are now bigger brands or they're big brands and we're still supporting them today. Um, the point we're trying to make here is that we do run the gambit, right? So it doesn't matter where you're at in your growth phase or, or what category you're in, what retailers you're in, right? We do have solutions that are tailored and focused to be able to support you. Um, on the far right hand side, just a couple of stats. I think for me, the most important one is that 80% of all purchases purchase decisions are influenced at shelf. Um, that's why getting on the list is so important, right? As you think about yourself and, and what you're in category for or how you shop, if someone's telling you to purchase Ripple as opposed to purchasing just almond milk or just a dairy-free milk, right? You're gonna be more inclined to put that off the shelf when you see that on your shopping list versus choosing maybe by price or other things like that. And so for us, our goal is to drive consumers to make those decisions ahead of time so we can actually drive conversion on the back end. And even though they're not listed here, we do see pretty solid you know, results with that from a sales of perspective. Um, at the end of the day, we are going to be a bit different from your typical DSP um, that's out there for you. Really, it's because we have a one-of-a-kind audience network. Our relationships with our apps are exclusive. Uh, nobody else can advertise in those apps. And so for us, capturing that data in real time allows us to reach them uh, when they're doing what they're uh, when, when they're on their grocery list, right? Actually planning that, that shopping trip, not scrolling on social and not doing other things. Um, it also allows us to get better insights so that we can actually pass that back to you to improve your other marketing efforts outside of that, but also improve results with campaign after campaign. Um, if you are doing it today or haven't considered doing it, right? It does open up a new channel for growth. Um, it allows you to kind of put yourself in the middle of the funnel um, and have a solution that actually provides significant uh, data and insights uh, that allows you to really complement and elevate your, you know, not only your retail media, other things that you're doing, right? I always talk about, and you know, with my clients, you know, they're asking us why use you and not use just Walmart or just Target, right? If you look at those individual retail media networks and and what's available to you there, they're not targeting and not reaching all the shoppers that shop there. 140 million Americans a year shop at Walmart, and only 20 million of them use their app. I'm not going to do the math, but in general, that's not en enough shoppers to be targeting in that only in that place to only do that, right? In general, it's super important to differentiate across the board and pick things in every single bucket so you can complement all of your solutions uh, and be able to, you know, grow at a faster rate. Um, I know we talked about this earlier and we, you know, I kind of showed you a couple of different buckets and different ways to spend uh, and where you can select different vendors. Um, but the one thing that I'll add here is shopping list marketing, right? It is new. It is evolving. Um, you know, one of the only people in the space or only vendors in the space that are doing this, that are capitalizing on pre-shop data and actually future looking first party data. And so as you begin to evaluate what tactics are right for you, um, you know, think about shopping list marketing, right? To reach verified shoppers while they're actively planning what to buy next. Um, I think that's really important to consider, you know, all of the options. And again, these media mixes might not be the same for all of you. We have some clients that spend only on the trade desk and only with Ibotta. And we have other clients that spend across so many different buckets. It's hard to keep track, um, but it's what works for them. And it's important, again, to pick what works for you. And so as you look at the key takeaways, you know, from this presentation, I think the, the main one for me is going to be put yourself in the shoes of the consumer, right? At the end of the day, whether you're a CEO, a brand manager, a marketer, or even me, the director of sales and marketing, right? I'm a consumer too. And so for me, to think about what I'm doing today and how that can be affected, right? That'll help you 
make better choices as you're setting reasonable goals that align with your business strategy. Um, third, don't give in to peer pressure, right? What everybody else is doing isn't always ever what's best for you. There are great tactics and repeatable strategies that have worked and continue to work going forward, but 100% of the time, they don't work every time, right? <laughs> and so finally, test and learn and then evaluate, execute and grow. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and put my video back on so that I can uh, answer questions. Yeah, sorry about that. I stopped recording for one sec, but uh, I went back on. I meant to unmute myself. Thanks so much, Aaron. I really appreciate it. Um, I think I'll kind of hit it off for the first question. Um, one of the things that stood out was you kind of talked about like some brands outsource a lot of their media spend um, to a consultant or to an agency. What are kind of the pros and cons you see between outsourcing it to somebody else versus like finding someone to do it internally or taking it on yourself? Like, what do you kind of see as best practices there and what we should be looking for if we do want to go find a consultant or an agency to, to kind of handle everything for us? Yeah, I think it depends. I mean, obviously your resources and what you have available to you is going to have an impact on, on the choices you make there. You know, a couple of years ago, um, a lot of the big brands like Campbell's, P&G, um, and Barilla actually started bringing their media in-house because they realized that by outsourcing it, they weren't getting all the data. And so I think that for you understanding, you know, what is it that you want out of those partnerships, right? Are you, are you bringing on a consultant and bringing someone on or an agency on to help you because they're actually specialists and you have no idea what you're doing? Or do you have some idea and you need to go to your peers to evaluate those things. You know, I think that there are risks in, in both buckets, doing it just yourself and doing it only with an agency. Um, but I think at the end of the day, if you know that, hey, I'm looking for data, I'm looking for insights, I'm looking for sales, I'm looking for these different things. Um, if you're able to set up the KPIs to measure the impact of that success and try it, just like we're working with you, right? We're trying a partnership and a marketplace partnership, never, never done it before, but it's been working really well for us. And we're really appreciative of that. And the way we've measured that is by, you know, setting up those goals and making sure that we're hitting them. And it's, it's worked for us, right? And I think that for everybody, it's one of those trial and error things. It's not always going to be the best investment sometimes. You're going to fail and it's going to happen. It's okay. You can just pick up, move on and try again. Awesome. Uh, so anybody can hit the raise hand button if you have questions. One was just direct message to me um, asking if you could please quantify the conversion using Ad Adapted. Yeah, for sure. So on average of all the products that we see that are added to list, over 80% of those convert to sale. And so for you, you might be thinking 100 products to list, 80 get actually, you know, purchased, right? My, my value is $5, whatever that might be. Um, you know, you can do the math on that. Um, but typically what we actually strive for is repeat purchase. And so of all that, of all of those products added to list, we typically see anywhere from 10 to 30% repeat purchase post campaign. So with no media being present, we're capturing organic viewability and impact um, across all the campaigns that we have measured. We've seen over a 3% lift on average. Some of our campaigns actually get a little bit higher than that. Um, but in general, we're targeting about a three to one row as across most of our campaigns. Awesome. Um, and then another question for me. Um, so I wanted to know, so obviously like we're always trying to figure out like what the right promotional mix is. Um, so whether we're on promotion, we're doing a demo or maybe we're doing a partnership with another company. Do you see a lot of people um, partnering at Adapter or other, other media spend um, promotions when they're also in promotion in, st in store? Or like, how do you marry your media spend with your trade spend uh, programs? Yeah, so we actually do that pretty often. Um, you know, we used to be positioned once upon a time. People saw us as a competitor to Ibotta, and we never have been. Ibotta is specifically for coupons, right? We actually do a lot of coupon campaigns with our brands that support their Ibotta campaigns. Uh, what we've learned um, from a lot of our clients, especially with coupons in general, is that those campaigns can be pretty a pretty heavy lift or pretty expensive up front, and often they aren't getting the full redemption. Like they're not spending all of their budget, which in some cases is great, um, but a lot of times they want to spend all of that budget so they can actually get all the trial, right? And all the, uh, all the return on that. And so we often are supporting that through our aware product. We don't feature that in our presentations. It's usually an added value piece to most of our campaigns where clients will come to us and say, hey, I've got you know these things running. Can you support that? And so we'll leverage our audience and our data and targeting to drive shoppers to redeem those Ibotta coupons. Um, with trade promotions, we're actually often promoting that with our add to list um, in our copy. And so often we'll run two for fives, 10 for tens for like Chobani and things like that. Um, we'll just support that during that time frame. And the nice thing about Ad Adapted Direct is that if you only have a week-long promotion or a four-day promotion, uh, you can set your budget for as little as $3 a day and support that promotion and get pretty high conversion uh, when you're doing that. Awesome. Um, well, uh, for everybody, this will be up on the YouTube channel next week. Um, Aaron, I wanted to know if some people were interested in learning more about Ad Adapted or getting in touch with you, where's the best place that they can do that? Honestly, just go to our direct website. 
Awesome. And yep. what's so your- if you go to adapted.com slash direct um, in the top right hand side, there's a way for you to actually engage up there and then you'll be able, you'll be directed right to me. Otherwise, if they want to go through you and have you continue to pass them through to, through to me, that's as, that's good as well. Cool. All right. Well, this will be up on the YouTube channel next week. If anybody wants to check out any of our previous webinars, uh, we have a ton of webinars from investors, um, a bunch of different people um, in the space. And so I was really excited to finally kind of tackle this issue since I know it's really on top of people's minds um, and figuring out how they're going to tackle kind of their retail sales goals in 2022. So Aaron, thank you so much uh, to everybody else. Uh, We'll give you back some time here uh, on your Thursday and have a great rest of your week. Yeah. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.